I'm Paul Probst, uh, uh, president of Jordy Canid and the inventor of the blind sight device. And uh, this video is pretty much about um, how the blind sight device came about. Um, there were some basic things uh, that happened a long time ago, maybe oh, more than 30 years ago. I used to backpack uh, in an area south of Asheville, North Carolina, uh, down the parkway past Pisca Inn and off the parkway to the west, a place called Shining Rock Wilderness Area. Uh, during the years I was doing that, uh, I ran into occasionally people doing wildlife studies. There were some people back uh, almost 30 years ago released some eagles there and had a uh, observation post uh, to check out the eagles. Anyway, on these pack, various pack trips, when I would run into these people, um, some of them had night vision. And this area where I used to like to go, um, this is before Gatlinburg was so big and stuff like that. And it's uh, 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 the, at night, if you would have a moonless night and it would be overcast, which that area is a lot, by the way, uh, what you'd have is uh, no light. Nothing. You know, deer, dogs, whatever, may be taking more light if there is light. But um, I was up there at times when there was simply no light, nothing. If somebody lit a match five miles away, it would almost blind you because your uh, irises would be completely open. Anyway, uh, uh, hanging around with some of these wildlife people, I, I got to up, look through some night vision, and I, I, I noticed some very strange things. I was used to using... Uh, binoculars uh, to look at animals during the day moving around various wildlife uh, in that part of the country bear uh, there's wild boar um, even though they, there's some people deny the existence of eastern mountain cougar I've seen some really big cats there and uh, all kinds of small animals um, one thing I noticed looking through these at night vision which I said belonged to I think the first one belonged to some university uh, the guy let me look through it and um, at night uh, on one of these moonless nights, I could see these animals moving around. Now, this area is a very hazardous area. A person in full daylight could very easily fall from the, many of the cliffs. But I noticed the animals worked, uh, uh, walked around at night with no particular regard. I mean, they, they moved like they did during the day, and yet um, they never seemed to fall off. I, I literally climbed down into some of these gorges to see if there was dead animals at the bottom. No, nothing unusual. So I came to the conclusion that even though a lot of the vet books said uh, uh, that most of these mammals don't echolocate, um, I came to the conclusion that they had to be using ambient sound to maneuver because there really was nothing else. Um, anyway, I know the phenomenon, I didn't think too much about it. If we crank ahead, through, we're talking here like early uh, 80s, late 70s, early 80s, uh, we get into the uh, early 2000s and I was working with service dogs. And one thing that's always a tragedy is uh, some dogs can carry a genetic blindness that doesn't kick in until late in life, five, year five to seven, something like that. For a service dog, that's a disaster, okay? So what happened was I ran into some blind service dogs, uh, one of which was being removed from service, and I wanted to do something for them. And I remembered them that they probably could echolocate, regardless of what the book said. And... Uh, I talked there with some friends and a few experts on the subject, and I decided that the reason dogs didn't do more echolocation was they simply couldn't make the sounds. They couldn't, couldn't make a sound like a porpoise. They couldn't make a sound like a bat. Okay, uh, About all they had to echolocate with was uh, the, cl the clicking nails when they're on rock or, or concrete or something. So I set out to build a sonar emitter uh, for use uh, in free air, not underwater. And, um, but one that would work like the various animals that do echolocation and see if giving the dog that kind of information would allow them to um, image their surroundings better. And in other words, to, to be able to perceive more objects from sound alone. Um, unsurprisingly, it worked. Um, the first version we built in 2013, uh, it was kind of noisy. We, the frequency was lower. Uh, it was a bit irritating to be around people, but and it was a very simple pulse. So really all the information it gave the dog was distance and uh, um, the angle, you know, where something was relative to, to the dog. And that's all. Um, as we went through the various iterations of the device, uh, we had to silence it, get it away from the, uh, even the, the, vision, uh, the version that worked, the first versions that worked that were 20 kilohertz. 
still had a very, very large switching transient and they clicked about like a grandfather clock, like an old grandfather clock. Um, the older generation, it wouldn't bother, but people, the younger people these days who haven't grown up with ticking clocks, everything's electronic for them, uh, weren't able to sleep through it. So it was back to the drawing board again and find another transducer and get things quieted down, and which we, which we, succeeded, uh, we succeeded in doing. Also, uh, the newer transducers we're using put out, had a higher acoustic output and could throw a more high frequency energy in front of the dog uh, for them to use to echolocate. Now what they do is this, the, the, the unit every half second puts out a, I'm going to get one up here. From here it puts out an ultrasound pulse that is extremely short, it's measured in microseconds. It puts out that pulse and the pulse is not just a simple pulse for the engineering types out there, it is a multiple pulse. There, the, the pulses at are uh, spread over a tiny fraction of a second, and they include a very large pulse and a couple of smaller ones. And um, this was an idea borrowed from dolphins. All right, dolphins put out a complex um, pulse, a, co a complex sound that allows them to know how far it is to something, what angle it is to them, you know, the direction, right? Um, they also can tell how big something is and its texture by how those pulses are distorted when they come back. They go out, perfect. They come back, distorted. And so they, they get all that information uh, from there. So uh, uh, we went through a number of iterations of this device until we finally got one that had uh, almost no audible sound at all. Even in a quiet room, most people will not hear any ticking or anything. You have to really put your ear right up to it. Uh, had a higher output, would take extreme, could produce these complex but very short pulses. And uh, uh, unsurprisingly, every generation of this thing, as it got better and better, the dogs that were being used to test it got better and better. And uh, their confidence levels, uh, the things you lose with blindness, the confidence level, you have fear, it sometimes grows. Um, they don't want to, the dogs don't want to be separated from you. A lot of that confidence comes back once they can, once they have a way to see things around them. Okay? And we've had some rather dramatic uh, differences happening with these dogs. Some dogs, oh, so time's going to vary. You put this thing on, a do on some dogs and it'll take them a couple weeks to really use it. Some dogs, uh, especially we had on a couple that were blind from birth and almost from the moment it was on, Within about three days, they were making almost full use of the unit, and and uh, like I said, they slow down, and a little more time after that, they start speeding up again. Uh, so I will reiterate something I said in another video: you need to still have a prepared environment for the dog. You you can't have a lot of jagged things hanging out there that they can harpoon themselves on, because uh, this will give them more confidence and maybe they could get overconfident and hurt themselves. So you still need to have a prepared environment for the dog. Anyway, we built, um, I think since middle of uh, 2013, there's been five complete designs for this. This is actually a research unit that's been refurbished, but um, the production units look just like this. No paint. <laughs> um, if it's going to last 10 years, um, paint wouldn't, on a dog, with them beating it around uh, and other dogs chewing on it occasionally, um, it's not going to last that long. But, uh, I mean, the, the finish wouldn't. So we simply do not finish them. It's an aluminum case, all stainless steel hardware, and uh, um, we basically made this thing about as rugged as we can. There will be, this is uh, March of 2015, when we're shooting this, there should be, by uh, early fall this year, some units a fraction of this size, shorter battery life than this, the extremely long battery life this has, but should be able uh, to be carried by dogs down below 15 pounds. And that's uh, something we've had a lot of requests for and that's something we're aiming at. Um, now that we have a unit that's working as well as we could make it, making another one smaller isn't that big a deal, but it'll take, it'll take a while to do te the, the necessary testing and to get it uh, out there from people's hands. But again, if you uh, have a small dog, you can't use this, check it on our site, watch. There will be announcements when the smaller units are available. Thank you very much.